Hey everyone, thank you for joining me today. My name is Amanda Guthrie and I am a PhD candidate at the Virginia Institute of Marine Science over in Gloucester Point, Virginia. I research our shorelines. I look at our marshes and I look at the fish that live in our marshes and I also look at how people affect our marshes. Today, I'll be talking about our coast, the Chesapeake Bay shorelines. Here is a picture of the Chesapeake Bay from satellites. I am down here towards the mouth of the bay in Gloucester Point. About 120 miles north of me is Washington, D.C. The bay is really long. It's about 200 miles long, which is the same as 3,520 football fields. We also have a lot of water here. The bay holds 18 trillion gallons, which is equivalent to 230 billion bathtubs. If you were to fill one bathtub every second, it would take almost 900 years to fill enough bathtubs to have the same amount of water that is in the Chesapeake Bay. The bay is also filled with life. There's over 4,000 different plants and animals here. About 350 of those are gonna be your fish species. And about 170 of those are gonna be your shellfish species. This includes your crabs and your oysters. We often call our typical swimming fish, fin fish, to differentiate them from the shellfish. We also have over 2,700 plant species. One of the iconic fish in the bay is the rockfish, also called the striped bass. Another recreationally caught fish is the Spanish mackerel, and this is a beautiful fish, as you can tell by its color pattern here. Another iconic species in the bay is the blue crab. And we also have the Atlantic menhaden. So this fish is caught and used to create fish oil, and it is also a key food source for a lot of other fish in the bay. A lot of other bigger fish will eat the Atlantic menhaden. Some of my other favorites include summer flounder, the Atlantic spade fish, speckled sea trout, the oyster toadfish. If you haven't heard the noise from an oyster toadfish, it's definitely worth checking out. The oyster toadfish can sound like a foghorn. So if you haven't heard it before, definitely take a minute and Google it after the talk is done. We also have the butterfly blenny here. Here is a skillet fish. This fish has a suction disc on the underside of its body, which it uses to cling to rocks and oysters. Here is a picture of a healthy, vibrant oyster reef. The marsh plants here is called smooth cord grass. The bay only has one species of seahorse called the lined seahorse. We also have the occasional visitors of the cow nose ray. They will school in very large groups and they will come into the bay during the summer. One of my favorites is the mummy chug. It is the fish that I am researching pretty extensively. And this is a male mummy chug here. You can see it has the blue speckles on the body of the fish and the tips of the fins are yellow. So it is very bright and colorful fish. Um, I say very beautiful. These fish live in our marshes. They live their whole lives in shallow water and move in and out of the marshes as the tide rises and falls. Many fish here will spend the first part of their life or a key part of their life in a marsh. So marshes are known as a nursery for many juvenile or young fish. They also provide habitat or homes for other animals, including ribbed mussels, snails, and worms. Marshes also provide shoreline protection. As the waves hit a marsh, the plants here, the smooth cord grass, slow the waves down and therefore protect the shoreline this reduces shoreline erosion. 
As sea level rises, marshes also potentially can keep up with sea level rise. As the water slows down, as it flows through the marsh, a lot of the sediment and particles and soil that was in the water falls down and can accumulate on the ground. This allows the land to rise as the seas also rise. Further, marshes are able to move inland if the water gets too deep for them to survive. There's a really cool relationship between ribbed mussels and smooth cord grass. This is called a symbiotic relationship where the mussels help the cord grass and the cord grass help the mussels. The mussels provide nutrients and food for the plant and then the plant in turn provides shade to help protect the mussels from the sun. Unfortunately, one of the ways that we are losing our marshes is through shoreline armoring. Shoreline armoring is bulkheads and riprap and is a hard structure that's placed in between the land and the water. This hard structure removes many of the natural processes that were occurring along a shoreline. Hard structures can also change the nearby land as the wave energy doesn't slow down or dissipate as it normally would throughout a marsh. In these cases, the energy is just pushed off to another area. This can increase erosion nearby. As you can see in this image, the groins that were installed in 1972 affected the shoreline and the nearby property. One way that people are able to combat shoreline erosion, but also maintain a lot of the natural processes is through living shorelines. Living shorelines use natural features like marshes to help protect our shorelines, but also potentially can have other added features like this oyster sill or this marsh sill. So in low weight energy settings, we can create marshes and plant marshes, and these can survive and slow down the wave energy and protect our shorelines. In higher wave energies, we'll have either a oyster reef with an, through an oyster sill or a rock sill, which is a small rock wall in front of the marsh. These small structures slow down the waves before they get to the marsh and therefore provide an extra level of protection. In high wave energy areas, marshes potentially are not going to be able to survive and beaches also occur here naturally. And so a offshore rock structure can also protect the beaches that were naturally occurring there. For my work, I look at living shorelines with this rock sill. I am part of a team of researchers. And one of our main questions is, how well does a living shoreline mimic a natural marsh? To do this, we researched various living shorelines and natural marshes throughout the bay. And one of the ways we did this is we put out cameras to record what was happening on the marsh. So I'm gonna play this quick video here. So I'm gonna play it twice. So there is a bird that hops on this sill about eight seconds in. So it's really fleeting, really, really quick. The bird will hop in and, and then leave. And then we also will be joined by a bird on the ground at the end. On the marsh side of things, there are snails and crabs that move along the ground when there's no water there. So when it's at low tide, at high tide, the snails will move up the cord grass to avoid the water. Okay, one more time, as I know that can go pretty quick.
On these cameras, we also recorded some birds poking around the marsh. We also saw a lot of birds using the sills as an area to feed. In our marshes, we were able to record the presence of diamondback terrapin. Not only did we capture them basking on the rocks here, we also were able to see small baby terrapins. One of my favorite photos are these pictures of these river otters. And if you see in the corner here, we also have a red fox that is eyeing the river otters. All of this was great to see, seeing how living drawings are able to create habitat for other species. But when we look at the trends over time of what type of modifications people are installing, we still see that people are often installing more bulkheads and riprap, which is the blue bulkhead and the white riprap here, then they are looking at living shorelines. Living shorelines can be installed more often than they are being installed. And this would help our overall ecosystem if we have more marshes and more living shorelines rather than bulkheads and riprap. Now coming back to our research question, how well does a living shoreline mimic a natural marsh? So we are very pleased to say that our work is showing that it does it very well. So very exciting to see that um, we're able to create and maintain habitat. Thank you all for joining me today. Um, I'm happy to answer some questions if you have any, but I also have some questions for you. Thanks everyone.